up fairly tall. A lot of the newer buildings are taller buildings, right? Uh, if you take a look at the top of this building, you'll see there's a little stick up at the top. That stick is called a spider. Uh, the spider is designed by the architect, so it is included in the height of the building. It is that spider that makes Trump Tower the second tallest building in Chicago. We're going to see the top three tallest on our tour here today. Now you'll also see up and down the sides of the building these patios, right? Each of those patios are at the heights of some of the other buildings around it. For example, this lowest one at the same height of the building that we were just next to, not including the clock tower. That second one at the same height as the building across the way. That's not by accident, that's by design. The architect here trying to make the building look good in context with the other buildings around it. So that's called contextualism, and we'll see a lot of examples of that as we continue on the tour. Now this building designed by a superstar architect, his name, Adrian Smith. Adrian Smith, born and raised right here in Chicago. Adrian Smith, famous for also designing the tallest building in the world, the Burj Khalifa in Dubai. You want to get a sense of how tall the Burj Khalifa is? You can take two Trump Towers, stack them on top of each other, including the spire, and that's about the height of the Burj Khalifa. So we don't have the tallest building in the world anymore here in Chicago, but we did raise the architect who went off and designed it, right? So we're going to count that, right? Now let's do a little compare and contrast. Cut across the river. Take a look at this building with the tower in the center. Would you guess is that older or newer? If you said older, you're already figuring out how to read our skyline. That building from the early 1920s trying to look like a cathedral in Europe. That's called the revival style of architecture. Every time you see one of those decorative buildings along the river, they're probably from the early 1920s in that revival style. As we come out from underneath the bridge, we're in the groovy 1960s over here on the right. Two very iconic buildings here in Chicago. These are Marina City, looking like corn on the cob. Now, Bertrand Goldberg is the name of the architect here, but of a social scientist, trying to change the way that people live. You see, back in the 1960s, not a lot of people lived downtown. They'd work here, they'd go home to the suburbs at night. So Bertrand Goldberg built Marina City as a city within the city. Apartments up above, valet parking down below. But inside the building, stores, restaurants, fitness center. Used to have an ice skating ring in there. Still has a bowling alley. Uh, used to have a movie theater, which is now the House of Blues. It's an introvert's dream, right? You can live your whole life without ever getting out of your pajamas in a building like that. So very popular for folks to live in urban city centers today in multi-use buildings, but it took architects like Bertrand Goldberg to get people down here. Now they call it Marina City because there's a place to park your yacht, which was very surprising in the 1960s because this was a very polluted waterway back then. Not something you'd want to spend a lot of time on. That's all changed. If you take a look over here to your left, you can see we've added about a mile of new shoreline to our river with our river walk from the early 2000s. This is a great example of a positive loop. As more folks come down to the river, the more interested they are in keeping the river clean. And as the river gets cleaner and cleaner, well, the more people come down and visit. And that just keeps getting better and better. And guess what? All of you are some of those people. So we're glad to have you down on the river here today. Now the next building we're going to take a look at after we pass under the bridge is a great example of how architects here in Chicago respect their architectural heritage. As we come out on the other side of the bridge, take a look over on the left. You'll see this building that changes about three quarters of the way down. This is the Builders Building. The front of that building from the 1920s, the annex and the roof added in the 1980s. Now take a look at the section from the 80s. You'll see it's built with modern materials and in a modern technique. But as we get closer and closer to the building, compare and contrast the two different sections, you'll start to realize that newer section, though it doesn't exactly copy what's come before, it is inspired by the older section of the building. It still respects that architectural heritage. So as we come out from underneath the bridge, you're going to get a closer look at the Builders Building. Once you're done taking a look at the Builders Building, we're going to cut across the river, and I'm going to point out a style of architecture that you'll see all over our city over here on the right. 
take a look at this big wide building on our right with that sort of green pyramid on the top. Let's look at some of the details first. You'll see soaring vertical lines up the surface of the building, leading to little setbacks up the top. All of that draws your eyes up the building, making for a very optimistic style of architecture. This is called Art Deco from the Roaring 20s, the late 20s to the early 1930s. Every time you see a building with soaring vertical lines up at the top, it's probably going to be that Art Deco style. Now this building is the Merchandise Mart. This is where merchants in Chicago would shop for goods for their stores back in the early 1930s. You would shop for a couch here. Shop at you shop at might shop here for 5,000 couches, if that makes that any clearer for you. Out in front of the building, you'll see there are pillars with busts of some famous American merchants. Names you might be familiar with. Montgomery Ward, Marshall Field, Woolworth, to name just a few. And if you're able to climb up one of those pillars and you push back real hard on one of those heads, a big hunk of candy comes out of the net. And that's a Pez joke, all right? I want you to know there are jokes on the tour, people. Relax. Uh, there's a lot of building, two full city blocks of building. If you took all of the office space inside of it and spread it out, it'd be over 14 football fields of office space. Well, as we come out from underneath the bridge, eyes up, cameras out as we come into one of the most breathtaking parts of the river. Welcome, everyone, to Wolf Point, a 360-degree view of architecture. Most of the buildings you see here built in just the last few years. Wolf well, Point's the name of the part of the river where the main branch is where we're on, meets up with the south and north branches. And the river is why Chicago is here. If you head out through that south branch, you can head out to the Mississippi, ultimately out to the Gulf of Mexico in one direction. If you head out the other way through the Great Lakes, it will take you out to the Atlantic Ocean, New York, and beyond. That makes Chicago the beating heart of the United States. Everything coming in and out right here in Chicago. Now straight in front of us where the points of the river meet, this building is called River Point, that makes sense, right? Uh, but because of the parabolic arches on the top and bottom of the building, some folks say it looks like the box your microwave hot pockets in. They yeah. call it the Hot Pocket Building. That arch on the bottom is to make way for a train line that runs underneath it. Uh, these circular holes, you see, those are exhaust fans for that train line. Now that train goes behind 150 North Riverside on our right. Uh, you'll see there's a setback at the base of the building when you're going through the train line. City mandates a 30-foot setback from the river, so the base of the building looks like a pencil standing on its point, which can be a little concerning given the height of the building. Nothing to worry about, it's very structurally strong, but I am going to point out today some techniques that builders use to build these really tall buildings here in this very windy city. You might know a lot of times these buildings are built to sway in the wind. That's good for the building, alleviates wind pressure. But to alleviate that sway, sometimes they put water in the tops of the buildings. This building has about 200,000 gallons of water built into the top of it. When the building sways in the wind, all that water sloshes. And the way of the water moves the building back towards center quicker. They're called inertial slosh dampeners. And that's the first of a few techniques we're going to talk about today for building these really tall buildings in this very windy city. Here on our left, another new addition to the skyline. This is the uh, Bank of America building from 2020. Uh, another example of respecting our architectural heritage, the building that was here from the 1950s, had these wavy silver panels on the side. When they tore down the older building, they saved those silver panels. Take a look at the base of the building. Those silver panels down there from the older building that was here before. It's just a decorative detail, but it's a nice tip of the hat to the history of architecture here on the river. As we come out from underneath the bridge, take a look over on our right. You'll see soaring vertical lines, little setbacks at the top. It's that optimistic Art Deco style again, like we talked about at the merchandise park. But when you think about the 30s and the 40s in the United States, what's going on? Well, you have the Great Depression, followed by World War II. Not a lot of buildings being built. It's not till the 1950s that architecture gets a reboot. Take a look at the next two buildings on our right from the 1950s. Two words probably come to mind. Black boxes. That's sometimes what they call this style of architecture. Black box modernism. 
Now, Mies van der Rohe is the name of the architect most closely associated with this style. Famous for saying, less is more. You might have heard of that before. Also believed form follows function. What does that mean? Well, what is the function of an office building? It's a big box that holds boxes, right? So that's what he builds. He builds big boxes. What's the box made out of? Metal and glass. That's what you see on the surface. No decorative details, no gargoyles. The idea, less is more. The beauty of the building comes from its honesty and simplicity. It's supposed to be an elegant style of architecture, like a simple glass glass. Now this stays popular throughout the 50s and the 60s. It's not till the 1970s that we see even a slight shift as we come out from underneath the bridge. Take a look at the next building on our right. You'll see how much has changed. We've gone from black boxes to white boxes, right? This is called the international style. The idea here is this is the type of building you can put anywhere in the world and it will fit right in because it doesn't have much to do with the space around it. And after three decades of boxy buildings that have nothing to do with the space that they're in, people start to get tired of this style of architecture. We've been talking about it for 30 seconds, and you all seem pretty tired of it, right? So let's take a look at the final building. Uh, we're going to point out here on our right this building covered in reflective glass, right, from the 1980s. Well, what does the reflective glass do? It shows off the neighbors. It's not just about the building anymore. It's about the space around it. The color of the glass, very similar to the color of the river. As the river curves, the building curves along with it. Why? It's trying to look good context, that contextualism that we talked about earlier starts in the 1980s. So the review, we started off with Art Deco in the Roaring Twenties, then black boxes turned into white boxes until we were thinking outside the box with contextualism by the 1980s. Does that make sense? Give me a thumbs up if you're following along. Great, you'll be all set for our quiz later. Now, we are getting a sneak peek of a building that we're going to see even better when we're out on the river. The captain is parked us right in front of the undisputed king of the Chicago skyline. Uh, we've got a lot to talk about with this building, so we're going to talk about it in just a bit. You might notice that we're doing our first turnaround here on the south branch of the river. We're going to head back up towards the main branch and get all of you out on the lake. As we head back towards that main branch, we're going to have our first break of the tour. That was a fantastic time to head down to the bar if you haven't already. Nothing makes you feel more like you're on vacation than having a drink in hand. And I'll tell you what, it makes my tour better as well. Once we get back to Wolf Point, I'll get back on the mic and we'll continue with our tour. I'll see you all again then.